European and Japanese beef consumption has plunged. 5,000 Germans are going vegetarian each week. McDonald's profits are the lowest point in years. A European insurer started offering discounts to vegetarians, and the Chancellor of Germany called for an end to factory farming. What is going on over there? <sighs> Good evening. <laughs> My name is Michael, and what I'd like to do is give a brief intro, um, talking about a little about E. coli, just because I can't, um, can't resist, um, and then talk about some of the background of this important um, crisis, and talk about both here domestically and overseas as well. Um, should be lots of time for questions. If, however, questions arise later on, please feel free to call or email me anytime for anything, and my contact information is on my website www.veganmd.org, V-E-G-A-N-M-D.org, which is a veg source sponsored website. For those of you who want to stay on top of this very volatile issue, I highly recommend what I think is the best mad cow site on the web, and that is the Organic Consumers Association website at organicconsumers.org. The best piece of writing that I've ever encountered on Mad Cow is a book by Sheldon and Rampton called Mad Cow USA. Unfortunately, it's out of print, but available free, full text, online at prwatch.org. That's P-R-W-A-T-C-H dot O-R-G. According to the CDC, 76 million Americans a year get food poisoning. If you do the math, that's one in four. Remember that 24-hour flu your coworker had this year? There's no such thing as a 24-hour flu. They got food poisoning. In today's food safety lottery, there's a one in 840 chance that we'll be hospitalized and one in 55,000 that we Americans will die from foodborne illness every year. It happens in restaurants. Thousands of Americans go out to eat every year and kind of don't <coughs> come back. <laughs> it, happens, it happens in our schools. Actually, a recent General Accounting Office study just released found that food poisoning cases among children in, in U.S. schools is increasing at about 10 percent every year. And it happens in our homes. Year after year, for example, USDA surveys find that up to nine out of 10 Thanksgiving turkeys are contaminated with Campylobacter, the most common bacterial cause of food poisoning. And 75% of those turkeys are contaminated with two or more foodborne diseases. Salmonella is most often the second one, which is growing dangerously resistant to five major classes of antibiotics in this country. And then, of course, there's still that jack-in-the-box E. coli 0157H7. It was but a little over three weeks ago that ConAgra recalled 19 million pounds of ground beef in the second largest beef recall in U.S. history. And my question is, where is the outrage? Mm -hmm. If 19 million pounds of beef <laughs> distributed to half the country were infected with a deadly E. coli strain by terrorists, we'd be going nuts. But because it was done by a Fortune 100 company, one of the most profitable country, uh, companies here in the United States, it's business as usual. And we recently found out that indeed our government, the USDA, knew about the tainted meat as far back as February and didn't investigate. Consumers barely twitch when the corporate machine that controls our food supply ships out another shipment of meat tainted with feces. We've come to expect it. Americans blame them themselves every time they don't sterilize their meat thermometer, every time they check to see if their fecal contaminants are done, every time they don't, every time they don't cook the shit out of it, literally. <laughs> There is no reason for anyone to get E. coli poisoning. It is strictly a byproduct of factory farming. 
one should ask oneself, is it reasonable that if a consumer undercooks a hamburger, their three-year-old dies? Anyway, Campylobacter, easily destroyed by proper cooking. Even this new super salmonella threat, luckily we still have big gun antibiotics that can deal with it. Even this E. coli 015787, overall kind of pretty wimpy pathogens. Imagine if there was something in our food supply that wasn't affected by cooking or antibiotics. Some, some ultimate pathogen, practically indestructible, evading our immune system and causing, oh, say, some invariably fatal neurodegenerative disease. Science fiction? Well, as you can probably guess, no. After three and a half million cattle dead, six and a half billion dollars wasted, a trial against Oprah Winfrey, and a Nobel Prize in medicine, we are left with over a hundred dead British youth who died of the human form of mad cow disease with they, which they contracted through the consumption of contaminated, infected beef. First, I'd like to start with background on the British situation. Bovine spongiform encephalopathy, what a word, right? Started in, uh, oh, dubbed mad cow disease by the British press, was first documented in 1986. Cows infected with this seemingly new disease became, started twitching, appearing jumpy and nervous. Uh, their gait became stilted and awkward. Many even became aggressive, at responding to handling by kicking as their brains degenerated into this characteristic sponge-like appearance under the microscope. Bovine, cow or cattle, spongiform, sponge-like, encephalopathy, brain disease. And mad cow disease spread like wildfire, becoming the most serious threat ever posed to British agriculture. But from a public health standpoint, what people wanted to know was, was it going to be, could it be passed on to people who ate beef? And you know, the British government initially denied such a link. They said that the number of cows that would get this disease would never be more than 20,000. And that human beings were the dead end host, meaning that it wouldn't cross over to any other species. But then, in 1990, Max, someone's pet Siamese cat, died of a feline spongiform encephalopathy. Now, like the disease in cows, no one had ever seen anything like it in cats before, and pet food containing rendered cattle parts was deemed the most likely explanation for Max's death. And infected food has since been blamed on the deaths of 80 more cats in Britain, and, and dozens of zoo animals, antelopes, ostriches, monkeys, that all started dying of these never-before-seen spongiform encephalopathies. Didn't seem like a dead-end host to anybody. And then, in 1994, Vicki Rimmer, a 16-year-old schoolgirl from Wales, was diagnosed with the human spongiform encephalopathy, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, or CJD, is a human spongiform encephalopathy whose standard clinical picture involves an invariably fatal and relentlessly progressive dementia. If you're lucky, you're dead within six months of this same kind of brain sponginess. Some cases last as long as 13 months or longer. Britain's health secretary has said, Quote, it's very hard to imagine a disease worse than CJD. Now, some may recognize this disease as that which killed renowned ballet choreographer George Balanchine. So we've known about this disease since the 1920s, really, but it normally attacks people in their 60s. Vicky was 16. It was like Alzheimer's attacking a teenager. And so it was this new form of the disease striking British young people that caused the British government to reverse its decade-old stance that British beef was safe to eat. Ironically, the announcement was made on Meat Out Day, March 20th, 1996. So they called this new variant CJD to distinguish it from the regular CJD. And the evidence linking this new disease in cows, BSE or man cow disease, and this new disease in people, new variant CJD, was, has been considered, quote, indisputable, unquote, by the medical community and the scientific community. So, okay, the first question, 
has been answered, whether or not people could get this disease from eating meat. The second question then became, well, how many people were going to get it? Is it just a few or is it going to be an epidemic? And that question has been answered as well. The question remaining then is, how large of an epidemic are we going to see among the human population? The incubation period, the time between when you become infected and when you start showing symptoms from disease, spongiform encephalopathies from diseases like this, can be decades for human beings. An Oxford study published in a scientific journal called Nature estimated that half a million infected cattle entered the human food supply in Britain. Now, no one knows how many people have already become infected and are currently incubating this disease in Britain. One estimate came from the British Statistical Society, which threw around possible worst case scenario estimates of up to 18 million people dead. Now, assuming a 15 year incubation period, all these young people now, just a few hundred or so dying now, were presumably infected in the early 80s. There are just but a few hundred mad cows. In 1990 alone, it's estimated that 250,000 BSE infected cattle were eaten, which of course begs the question how many people may be dying in the years to come. Now, the reason that so many infected cattle could enter the beef supply is because there's an incubation period in cattle as well. There's no pre-mortem test for BSE, meaning you can only tell kind of on autopsy after the cow's already died. And infected cattle harboring the disease could be slaughtered for food before they started showing symptoms, right? overt <laughs> symptoms. In this way, mad cow disease might resemble AIDS, another devastating, deadly disease that, you know, with this long incubation period. In general, it's not the people with full-blown AIDS that are passing around HIV. It's people that are infected and infectious, but appear perfectly fine. And in much the same way, the bulk of infected beef entered the British food chain from these cattle who appeared perfectly healthy. It's been estimated that on average, every adult of the 60 million people that live in the UK has eaten, on average, about 50 meals containing infected tissue. Along the same lines, the reason that 90% of the cases in Britain were found in dairy cows is because they're actually allowed, in Britain at least, to live six or seven years before retiring them into ground beef. Beef cattle are killed after just three years, allowing them time to become infected and infectious, but before many of them start showing symptoms. Unlike AIDS, though, the pathogen thought to cause these diseases, mad cow disease and CJD, seems new. Not a virus, not a fungus, not a bacteria, but thought to be a prion, an infectious protein. No, I mean, it's been called the strangest thing in all biology. No one really knows exactly how they even replicate. In fact, the whole concept of prions challenges what's called the so-called central dogma of modern biology. But because of their unique structure, they are practically invulnerable. They can remain infectious for years in the soil. They're not adequately destroyed by cooking, canning, freezing, usable doses of UV or ionizing radiation, stomach acid, uh, enzymes of the digestive tract, all ineffective in destroying their infectivity. Even heat sterilization, domestic bleach, and formaldehyde sterilization all have little or no effect. One study even raised the disturbing possibility of whether or not even incineration could guarantee the inactivation of prions. The guy who did that study, Paul Brown, medical director for the US Public Health Service, found infectivity after 600 degrees Celsius, right, that's over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt lead for 15 minutes, reducing the sample to ash, still found infectivity. He's quoted as saying, prions are, quote, probably the most single, most resistant organism on the face of the earth. Further, it's actually incompatible with biological life as we know it. Kind of when I was raising a stink about this issue about eight years ago at Cornell, the, um, the food safety department brought, the food science, excuse me, very far from food safety, food science department brought in the world's expert on these diseases, Dr. C.J. Gibb, who um, ran the Brain Studies Laboratory for the National Institutes of Health, kind of to put everyone's mind at ease um, after what I was talking about on the campus. 
Actually, he did quite the opposite, and I thrust up my hand trying to get the first question in after he stopped speaking, but no, the first question went to a food science professor, you know, long white lab coat, who asked, you know, we know all about, you know, E. coli, cook the meat through. What food preparation methods can we use to eliminate the risk of contracting mad cow disease? And Dr. Gibbs, with a straight face, mind you, said, well, there are three ways. He said, first, you can take your side of beef and you can autoclave it for an hour. It's kind of like this <laughs> hospital sterilization technique. Or two, you can take your burger and, burger and marinate it in a concentrated alkali like Drano. <laughs> or he said, you know, you could marinate your burger in Clorox bleach, but he says it has to be fresh bleach as soon as you open the cap. The potency starts to decline. <laughs> Prions have been called the smallest, most lethal, self-perpetuating biological entities in the world. All right, what about North America? This same Dr. Gibbs, world-renowned expert, has been doing this research in this area for decades, actually chaired the World Health Organization's investigation into mad cow disease, was asked, unfortunately died recently, but was asked, if he thought we had mad cow disease here in the United States. And he said, quote, do I believe BSE is here? Of course I do, unquote. Then there's Stanley Prusiner, the scientist who won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for discovering prions, right? He also thinks BSE must be in the United States. Now, none has been reported, so why would two of the most prominent scientists in the world in this field say such a thing. Well, it's thought that one in a million cows every year naturally develop BSE or mad cow disease, just like one in a million people seem to spontaneously develop CJD. Annually, we slaughter about 36 million cows in this country, so it means we should have like 36 mad cows entering our food chain every year. Now, 36 cows is considered so few that both these scientists feel that the American beef supply could be safe, but they're worried. And what they're worried about is that the same thing that happened in Britain could happen here. All right, well, what happened in Britain? Where did this disease come from? Well, one of the leading guesses as to how cows got this disease was by eating diseased sheep infected with a sheep spongiform encephalopathy called scrapie. Now you may be saying, wait a second, cows don't eat sheep, they're herbivores. Well, I hate to dispel myths of picturesque pastures and fragrant hay, but this is modern agribusiness. And in modern agribusiness, we use protein concentrates, or meat and bone meal, both euphemisms for mashed up bits of animals left over at the slaughterhouse floor and kind of boiled down or rendered down into animal feed, animal feed, which is fed to dairy cows, for example, in this country, to increase milk production. If you don't use these supplements, these protein supplements, milk cows only make 10 to 50 pounds of milk a day. As one Cornell dairy specialist put it, quote, you just can't get a reasonable amount of milk without supplements, unquote. <laughs> now, you can give them corn or soybeans as a supplement, perfectly wonderful, but Slaughterhouse byproducts are usually cheaper. So not only have we made cows meat eaters, but cannibals as well. Now, while the 36 mad cows entering our food supply doesn't sound like a lot, because of the commingling of many different animals' body parts at the rendering plants and feed mills, the average cow, pig, chicken, etc., eats the body parts of thousands of different animals over their brief lifetime. It's kind of like unsafe sex. You're not just eating that cow, you're eating every cow that that cow ate. <laughs> <laughs> and it's that recycling of rendered cattle protein into cattle feed, which is probably what led to the British epidemic's explosive spread, and that's what we're worried about here in the United States. On that faded Oprah show, Oprah tried to remind the audience that, hey, cows are supposed to be herbivores, right? But Gary Weber, um, director for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, 
stammered, I love this quote, quote, now keep in mind before you, you view the ruminant animal, the cow is simply a vegetarian. Remember, they drink milk. <laughs> Uh, a, uh, another brilliant defense of cow cannibalism from the industry came from Cornell Meat Science, they actually have a meat science department, <laughs> meat science professor Donald Bierman, who said, quote, theoretically, the best protein for dog is dog, for a cat is cat, and for a cow is cow. For that matter, the best protein for humans is human. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless of whether BSE appears here spontaneously or comes from scraping, we have an epidemic of the sheep spongiform cephalopathy here in the United States. By feeding cattle remains to cows, we could get a little epidemic of our own and then everyone loses, the animals, the industry, the government, the consumers. By the time BSE was officially recognized in Britain in 1986, there were vast numbers of cows already incubating the disease. By the time we report our first case in the US, it may be too late to stop an outbreak because of our three to eight year incubation period in cattle as well. It would seem absolutely necessary to enact a ban and stop feeding cows to cows. And the good news is, 1997, after years of fighting the industry, hey, we got our ban. The ban says you cannot feed the muscles or bones of most animals to cows and sheep. All right, well, hey, we won, huh? What's, what's the worry about, you know? All right, well, we got lucky. Few loopholes. First of all, blood is exempted. You can still feed calves cow blood collected at the slaughterhouse. Now, why would you feed, let's think about this, why would you feed the calf their mother's blood instead of their mother's milk? <laughs> Anybody? Because then, then, then milk can be fed to humans. Well, that's our milk, right? Wait a second, right? The calf can't drink that, that's good. Yeah, all right, so what do the calves get? Well, the calves get milk replacer, which too often contains spray-dried cow's blood as a protein-rich component. And I was talking to, uh, I was talking to a farmer um, who said, you know, that you know, cows won't eat feed composed of more like than 10% blood, because they can like taste it or something, they just don't like it. But chickens, on the other hand, you can feed them feed composed of 35% blood by weight, and they just like peck like it, they love it. They're very excited to tell me that. <laughs> If the U.S. government, if the U.S. government is so sure that blood is not infectious, then why was there a major change in American blood policy, excluding a few hundred thousand donors, right? Any, basically, anyone who spent a few months in Britain over the last 20 years is absolutely excluded from donating blood in this country. Just last month, the FDA extended it to travelers who spent a while in France and may actually extend it to travelers of all of Western Europe. And the reason they instituted the ban is because we now have experimental proof that indeed blood is infectious. These prions travel throughout the blood of infected animals, right? Yet it's still being allowed to be fed to livestock here in this country and that just simply has to end. And you can still feed pigs and horses to cows, they're exempted too, right? You can grind up cattle, feed them to pigs, and then grind up the pigs and feed them back to the cows, totally legal. Right. Or you can grind up cows, feed them to chickens, and then feed the chicken litter or chicken manure back to cows. Done all the time. Perfectly legal. Right. Prion disease is actually the only disease for which two Nobel Prizes were ever awarded. The first Nobel went to a guy named Gaidacek who um, was quoted on Dateline NBC as saying, quote, it's got to be in the pigs as well as the chicken, as well as the cattle. It's got to be passing through the chickens, unquote. Paul Brown, that U.S. Public Health Service guy also believes that pigs and poultry could be harboring BSE and passing it on to humans, adding that pigs are especially sensitive to the disease. Quote, it's speculation, but I'm perfectly serious, unquote, he said. Europe has forbidden the feeding of all animals to livestock, and that's what we need to do here in the United States. Now, the American Feed Industry Association disagrees. They call such a ban a radical proposition. 
The American Meat Institute also disagrees with such a ban, stating, quote, no good is accomplished by prejudicing segments of society against the meat industry, unquote. <laughs> the highest risk domestic meat, however, may very well be venison. Chronic wasting disease, disease dubbed mad deer disease, is a prion disease of wildlife affecting deer and elk. Seems to be only found one place in the world, Colorado. Well, that's where it seems to have started. Now spreading like wildfire through nine states from New Mexico up to Canada. Just jumped the continental divide over into Wisconsin where a mass killing zone has been set up where they're planning to eradicate tens of thousands of white-tailed deer in a vain attempt to slow the spread of this disease. Well, wait a second, how is that disease spreading? I mean, deer don't eat each other. Well. Chronic wasting disease seems unique in that the prions seem to be spread by casual contact between the deer, by nose kissing or licking at the same salt lick, or not exactly sure how, but now that's scary. The prions spread by casual contact. We now have a few dead hunters here out west, um, and now we've actually shown in a laboratory that indeed, in a test tube at least, these deer and elk prions can infect human brain tissue. Right? So, ah, for your family's sake, for everyone's sake, I highly recommend against eating venison um, in North America. We need to close up the loopholes and we need strict enforcement. Um, Two Januarys ago, the FDA published a national survey of rendering plants and feed mills, and a quarter of the plants were found in violation of these feed ban rules. Right? So four years after this supposed ban went into effect, we were still feeding cows to cows in this country. We need to also make CJD a reportable illness. Right? Neuropathologists are paranoid. No one wants to do autopsies on atypical dementia cases, because you've got to come in like a spacesuit and you can't sterilize your instruments. And, and when researchers have actually gone back and looked at presumed Alzheimer's deaths, right, said Alzheimer's on the death certificate, they actually went and looked back at series of these cases between 3 and 13 percent were actually CJD, were actually dying of spongiform encephalopathies in this country. As of last year, Alzheimer's deaths were the ninth leading cause of death in this country. So thousands of people may already be dying of these spongiform encephalopathies in this country, and we just haven't been following it. Unlike Europe, where every European country tracks this disease to the hilt, we don't do it here in the United States. Now, there has not been a single case of mad cow disease reported here among the cattle population in the United States, despite almost 20,000 cattle brains being looked at by the U.S. government. Now, of course, that's out of 300 million slaughtered over the last decade, right? France has one-fifth the cows we have, and they're inspecting 36,000 cows a week. Germany's up to 20,000 cows a week. Germany also once confidently declared itself mad cow free until they actually started looking intently for it and they found 30 cases within months. Right? You cannot find what you're not looking hard enough for. If we had the same incidence of mad cow disease as France have, for example, where people are dying of this disease, we just simply would not detect it. So I would urge every one of you to please go to an excellent website called testcowsnow.com. One word, testcowsnow.com, and in the very least, sign a petition to pressure our government to adequately um, survey the cattle here in the United States. Texas A&M researcher Tam Garland describes the number of tests as phenomenally small. She says she's not surprised that suspect animals haven't all been reported. She says, quote, as a rancher, you're not going to haul a vet out onto the range to look at a dying animal only to get fingered by your neighbors as the cause of plummeting beef prices. And this year, indeed, a USDA spokesperson said, if we get, quote, if we get BSE in this country, our cattle industry goes down the tubes, unquote. Ranchers don't want that. And there are only 17 full-time inspectors for 14,000 facilities. <laughs> now, there has been suspicion that even if a rancher did report 
the uh, case that our government might intentionally try to cover up any suspect cases in an attempt to protect the $150 billion beef industry. Beef is actually the number one revenue source for American agriculture nationwide. And the US beef export business alone is worth billions, and which would just close down overnight with a single reported case. You know, one of the problems, as many English pundits saw it, is that the British Ministry of Agriculture represented the interests of both consumers and the beef industry. Right? We have a similar conflict of interest here in the United States. The mandate of the USDA is to promote agricultural products. Yet at the same time, they're the ones in charge of protecting consumer health, like doing the meat inspections and all that. And of course, who's the new chief of staff for Bush's new Secretary of Agriculture? Dale Moore, lobbyist for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. <laughs> the inclination of governments to suppress information contrary to business interests has been documented over and over on this and many other issues. It's been estimated that thousands of animals went unreported throughout Europe. In fact, um, inquiries into the mishandling of the whole mad cow affair were set up by the European Parliament, and they accused the European Agricultural Commission and the British government of, quote, deplorable behavior, concealing the truth, blatant instances of negligence, serious omissions. You know, one of the examples they cited, I'll just mention one, was an internal memo which was leaked from the European Commission Department of Consumer Affairs. This is brought to light by a leading French consumer publication. The memo describes instructions given to the Standing Veterinary Committee in Europe, composed of veterinary officials of all the European Union states. Item one of the memo starts, quote, we must take a cold attitude towards BSE so as to not provoke unfavorable market reactions. No longer should BSE be spoken of, unquote. Item two, quote, we are going to ask the United Kingdom through official channels to stop publishing any more research results, unquote. And the document concludes, quote, in the general context, this BSE affair must be minimized through disinformation. Better to say that the press has a tendency to exaggerate." Unquote. Well, speaking of disinformation, how has the American beef industry uh, responded to the British crisis? Well, our cattle industry feel, asserts that no animal could ever enter into a U.S. packing plant or slaughterhouse displaying BSE symptoms. Well, I mean, even if that were true, remember the bulk of infected cows uh, you know, become beef while they're infected but not yet displaying BSE symptoms. And in America, it may even be harder to stop infected cattle from entering the food supply because we, since dairy cattle are routinely slaughtered much early here in the United States, over half of U.S. dairy cows are slaughtered before their fourth birthday. This, the Americans eat 2.6 billion pounds of these cold dairy cows annually. One-fifth of all hamburger meat you see at a, at a grocery store comes from these retired dairy cows. I actually have a great slide from Feed Management Magazine, which I didn't bring. It um, has a picture of a dairy cow with the caption, quote, I need all the feed I can get. I am, after all, two of the four basic food groups. <laughs> now, beyond the speculation that one in a million cows in the U.S. get it spontaneously, there is at least circumstantial evidence that we have at least a rare form of BSE already here in the United States. Richard Marsh, unfortunately also um, died recently, was a chairman of the Department of, Con of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. A year before BSE was even reported in Britain, before the world even knew about it, he was alerting dairy practitioners in this country to the possibility of, quote, a previously unrecognized scrapie-like disease in cattle, unquote, existing here in the United States. Well, see, mink are sentinel animals, like canaries and coal mines. They were actually the first to show toxicity from DES and PCBs. And since 1960, there have been four outbreaks of a mink spongiform encephalopathy on U.S. fur farms. You know, and this perplexed researchers who've been trying to to infect mink with scrapie for years to no success, but the clue came in 1985 when mink spongiform encephalopathy wiped out 
a population of minks at a fur farm in Wisconsin, and they hadn't eaten any sheep at all. The meat portion of their diet consisted almost exclusively of dairy cattle called downers, an industry term that's used to describe dairy cows that are cows in general that are, you know, fall down for unknown reasons and are kind of too sick to stand back up. And Dr. Marsh believed that there was a form of BSE in the United States and that it manifested itself as more of a downer cow disease than a mad cow disease. But for a moment, swinging back to the British situation, described by British, by London's chief medical officer as the big question, are these 100 cases of new variant CJD among British young people, is this the tip of the iceberg? I mean, is there like a CJD time bomb ticking in the British population? Well, you know, years, two years ago it was a death a month and up to a death a week, projected a death every day with a sky's the limit. Stanley Prusner, the guy who won the Nobel at UCSF, was asked on, uh, this is on CBS News, was asked if in his darkest moment he thought that this was going to be the plague of the 21st century. And Prusner said, quote, I don't need a dark moment to wonder if that's the case because everybody's wondering that, unquote. The chairman of the British government's advisory committee, Sir John Patterson, still talking about the potential for millions of human deaths. We as a population, he recently said on TV, are in deep trouble. Now, what kind of data has scientists still talking about plagues of biblical proportions? I mean, there's only been about 150 human deaths so far. I mean, where are they getting these numbers from? Well, you know, I mean, how do you find out how many people are currently incubating this disease? What we'd like to do is, you know, go get kind of 100 people off the street and you know, kill them, look at their brains, you know, and see what's happening in there, you know. There's these pesky Nuremberg laws and all that. Uh, yeah. Well, so let's go to the zoo and kill some monkeys, which is what researchers did. Monkey chow, it turns out, um, in Britain at least, is made from beef fit for human consumption. So researchers went to three zoos, grabbed 18 primates, all apparently totally healthy, murdered them, and on autopsy, how many of the 18, do people think, were presumably infected and incubating this disease as they had prions building up throughout, throughout their brains? How many of the 18? Good audience, 18 out of 18. All of them, all of them were incubating BSE. The researchers couldn't help but preliminarily conclude that BSE has what they call a high dietary penetrance in primates. That 18 out of 18 does not bode well for our species. Doctor, I'm sorry, did you say the monkey chow is un they feed them unfit? No, no, beef fit for human consumption. They were eating the same beef as we are, and they were all incubating this disease. Now, there actually may be a blood test out soon. Um, which we're really hoping for, the National Animal Disease Center in Iowa, what they're hoping to do is start doing random anonymous blood bank testing, like kind of early 80s HIV testing, just to get a sense of how much of the population is looking forward to dying from this disease. The head of the lab which came up with this test was quoted recently as saying, quote, this test could lift the weight from the shoulders of millions of people or tell them they're gonna die of a horrible disease. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and even better though, some Israeli scientists have found that our kidneys actually filter, um, concentrate prions out of our blood and we actually pee them out. So there actually may be, may be a urine test out soon, which is even better. Um, other recent developments, um, a 74-year-old um, was diagnosed with this new variant of CJD in Britain, kind of expanding the age range, and a newborn infant who um, who, um, born to a mother who died of variant CJD within a few months after birth, seems to be inf infected as well, and that's bad. In biology, we call that vertical transmission, transmission from mother to offspring, and that, you know, so now, thousands of women throughout Europe could be incubating this disease and passing it onto their newborns, and, you know, this CJD epidemic could then last for decades, for generations. The the grandmother who had to nurse her daughter and now her granddaughter to their deaths um, spoke to the press. She blames her daughter's death on, quote, 
the greed of the agricultural industry. She said, quote, our family is being destroyed, she said, by a man-made disease that never should have happened. In North America, we are left with an industry that continues to risk public safety and a government that seems to protect business interests over those of the consumer. A 1991 internal USDA memo, which we retrieved through the Freedom of Information Act, demonstrated that our government indeed weighed the pros and cons of a number of preventive measures, including a total ban on the feeding of um, ruminants to cows and sheep, realizing that this would minimize the risk to public health. They go on to say that the disadvantage of this approach is, quote, that the cost to the livestock and rendering industries would be substantial, unquote. <laughs> and the lost revenue to producers of such a ban was estimated as at up to a nickel per cow per day. Oh my God. But by their own admission, the cattle industry, the spokesperson for the Cattlemen's Association, said, eight years ago now in an industry publication that the industry could indeed find economically feasible alternatives to feeding rendered animal protein to other animals, but that the cattlemen industry didn't want to, quote, set a precedent of being ruled by activists, <laughs> unquote. <laughs> the German Farmers Association blamed the central problem of the BSE crisis on, quote, that British greed for profits, unquote. I don't think corporate profiteering is limited to Britain, however, and I think this crisis goes to show to what length government will go to prevent financial harm to powerful lobbies in general, and in doing so risk immeasurable harm to those they claim to represent. Earlier I compared prion diseases to AIDS, um, and like AIDS, although terribly de devastating, this disease is largely preventable. David Terrell, government appointed chair of their Mad Cow Investigation Committee, has said, quote, if you want to be absolutely sure you don't contract the human form of BSE, you should not eat beef and you should not eat products that contain beef proteins. Thank you. <laughs>